In my house, there's rules. I know there'd be rules in your house too. Some of our rules we would have in common in both households. Others would differ. You would be glad that you don't live in my house if you heard some of the rules that we had and probably vice versa. When Megan and I got married, we started living together at that point and clashed so much. And um, I reflected on that over the years because it was quite a shock to me. I thought as soon as we got married, wow, it's just going to get better and better. Um, and, you know, I since worked out the main cause of that friction. And this is not a setup for a joke on a rare occasion. I'm serious. We came from two different sets of rules. Rules that form structure around our families of origin. Rules that formed our identities as members of those families. And we were born into two different tribes. Now we came together not only to try and live in peace, but to try something far greater than that. We were making a new tribe, new rules, new identity. Now, nearly 14 years on, we don't have a fraction of the friction we used to have when we first got married. Because those treaties have all been signed. We've got them. We've established the rules of how we run our house now. The rules in our house are now forming the identity of our children. Our house rules work, help them work out what is right and what is wrong. And hopefully will help them combat sin. Surely even if slowly. Furthermore, our house rules reflect what Megan and I are all about. The rules our children abide by in our house are a reflection of our character, for better or worse. Some of them you might think, your parents are crazy. We don't have one set of rules for our kids and live by a completely different set of rules. That would make any rules we had for them redundant in forming their identity and character because they would simply just wait to break them or break free from them if they sensed that injustice. Rules reveal character and shape identity. And where there's a double standard, there will be an identity crisis Therefore, in our house, we have one set of rules for everyone. However, we do have an age-dependent relationship with those rules. For instance, I don't have to eat my vegetables in order to get dessert. I can eat whatever I want. I'm 45 years old. When my children come to my house, God willing, at the age of 45, they too don't have to eat their vegetables before they get dessert. It's their choice. Same rule for them as it is for me, age dependent. In other words, Megan and I don't live by anything we don't want our kids to become. That means when our children are adhering to the rules of our household, you will know what kind of people we are, Megan and myself. How they act in that moment of obedience, and it is just a moment, you can tell what we're about. Now, please don't, when we break for coffee, go and judge my kids in order to try and judge our character. That's not going to be pretty. Our children are a work in progress. Often more work than progress, but so are we. Aren't we all? We are. 
sin compels my children to break identity and do what they know is wrong. They know it's against the rules. Just like their dad. And in those moments of disobedience, we misrepresent our family. God gave Israel house rules. House rules that reveal his character. And those house rules would shape their identity. It's called God's law. It's a beautiful law. We often uh, cringe when we hear about law as opposed to grace, and rightly so. However, the law itself, that's beautiful. That's a law that gives life. It's a law that radiates the glory of God as it is a reflection of his wonderful ways and his character. God's law is what he is all about, impeccably. It's a picture of holiness. Love it. Look forward to it. If you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, look forward with great hope to an ageless existence where we all live with Christ, with new bodies, but new natures in accordance with that law. It's going to be amazing. In fact, the law won't be necessary. It'll be a lawless existence because we won't need it because now God's law reveals our character impeccably in Christ when we are glorified. Look forward to that. But at this point in our journey in Exodus, there was a need for God's law and it was communicated to God's people, Israel, in no uncertain way. Moses had gone up and down the mountain of Mount Sinai where they were positioned in the Sinai wilderness. He'd gone up and down a couple of times having conversations with God. What a privilege. And yet we can. And we read the scene in Exodus 19. On the third day when morning came, there was thunder and lightning, a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud blast from a ram's horn so that all the people in the camp shuddered. That's quite a blast to get hundreds of thousands of people to shudder. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke because the Lord came down on it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain shook violently. What a presence. As the sound of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, they were shuddering then. What are they doing now? Moses spoke and God answered him in the thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai at the top of the mountain. Then the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain and he went up. Talk about a heavy scene. Talk about a heavy calling. Come here, Moses, into that mess. Fierce. So Moses goes back and forth and the people of Egypt, uh, people of Israel stand there looking up. Exodus 19.12. They were instructed to put boundaries around the mountain for all the people. Be careful that you don't go up on the mountain or touch its base. Anyone who touches the mountain must be put to death. This is holy ground now. This is the presence of God. You touch that, you will be put to death. When we read this treacherous account of God's presence and his intolerance of uncleanliness, Don't let it be a bad reflection on God. On the contrary, let it be a good reflection on God. We should marvel at God's grace and mercy to have removed those boundaries from his presence 
in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We too would be killed if we would try to reach out and touch God if it weren't for Christ, our mediator. And now we're invited to run and embrace him. Let's look at the law God gave to Moses, namely the Ten Commandments. There was a lot of law, but it is the Ten Commandments that we're looking at today. They really help us to understand the Old Testament. In Exodus 19.6, God said to Israel, you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. Priests were to represent God to the people and represent the people to God. This nation would represent God. Now, if they were to represent God to the nations, they must be like God. And the law defines how God's holiness is to be manifested in the lives of these men and women of Israel. The Ten Commandments were both a corporate constitution for their nation and yet a very personal revelation from the heart of God to his children. In other words, these laws shape Israel's identity and reveal God's character. Exodus 21 to 2, we read, Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Listen to those words. That's before God's going to give his law. He says those words. Think about them in the context. With the flashing and the trembling and the quaking and the thundering. At the outset of giving his people this timeless law, these commands, he says those words about Egypt. I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. Why? Why? Well, he's laying down the foundation for his commands. Why would Israel listen to God about how he thinks they should live? Why would you do that? Because he gave them life. Because he saved their life. Because he was protecting their life. He's the source of their life. He's reminding them of the precious relationship that he has already established with his people by that great redeeming act. Of course they should be his people. Of course. He is their God. He brought them out of slavery. He doesn't say, obey me because I'm mightier than you. See this mountain, how it's quaking? You better obey me. He doesn't say that. Nor does he want any service that doesn't come from a glad-hearted answer of gratitude to his loving grace and provision and mercy. He doesn't want that. We don't serve God to get what we want. And we don't serve God to make him feel better. We serve God for who he is and what he has done. Now we come to the Ten Commandments. When he's established that foundation, this is who I am. And I'm about to tell you how to live. And that's why you should. We come to the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are amazing law. Western civilization has been built on them and developed on them in such a way that has impacted the world greatly. We have, in Western civilization, developed universal human rights, created women's equity, ended slavery, created parliamentary democracy, among other amazing, unique uh, achievements based on this law. Not only are these commandments relevant today as they ever were over 3,000 years ago when they were given, 
they still remain the recipe for a perfect world, a peaceful world, a world without tyranny. Imagine a world where there was no murder or theft. Just imagine that. Imagine a world where you had no need for police. That would be that world. No murder, no theft, no crime, no need for police, no need for military, no need for weapons, because there is no combat. A world where women and children can walk anywhere, any time of day or night without fear of being robbed or killed or children being snatched from tents, sleeping bag and all. Imagine a world where no one coveted their neighbour, no jealousy. A world where children honoured their mother and father and the family unit thrived. A world in which people didn't lie. The recipe for paradise is in God's command because it reveals his character. That's heaven. But these Ten Commandments are based on the belief that they were given by a higher authority than any other. And that's why we should believe them. That's why we should live by them. It's not some king. It's not some queen. It's not some government. It's not some nation. It's God himself revealing these commands. That's why the most important verse possibly in this whole passage is verse 1, then God spoke all these words. That's significant. God is indispensable to these commandments because we don't know right or wrong without God. We don't. We, d- we, we think we have a conviction of what we feel is right or wrong. Problem is... Not everyone else shares our conviction. And so where do, you, where do you go from there? Chaos. There's a need for an absolute authority and God is that absolute authority and his commands are the absolute authority. The Ten Commandments are divided in two parts. The first commands are our duty to God, the first four. The last six would concern our duty to ourselves and our duty to one another. Let's just look at them now. We'll go through them one by one. Exodus 20, verse 3. Do not have any other gods besides me. Good idea. Why? Because all other gods are false. Every other God, every other religion, fairy, angel, whatever it is, if it's not Yahweh, it's false. He's the one true God. That's what being the one true God actually means. I am what I am. He's the great I am. I think he demonstrated that in Egypt when gods were just falling by the plague. So... Good idea, don't have any God other than him. Exodus 24, do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Interesting, there's a lot of that going on. The appropriate way to worship the one true God, the inconceivable God, is to not make caricatures of his image out of the very things that he's made. That does not mean if we have a picture of Jesus in our house that we're in sin and we need to, you know, obsessively go through and get rid of crosses and, and paraphernalia like that. But we do need to consider what value we place on those things. Are they sacred? Are we superstitious in our approach to them? Is there any significance in those items that we might have in our home that would constitute false worship? Because we need them too. We need God, but we need this. And this is how we get to God. No, 
That's false worship. You know, worship of a man-made representation of God is nothing less than hatred for God. Exodus 20, verse 7. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. To misuse the name of the Lord is to show contempt for him. We don't use our mother's name as a swear word if we're in a healthy relationship with her because we wouldn't want to dishonour her. We'd never do that. How could we do that with a righteous God? It's punishable by death. Exodus 28. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The seventh day of the week was the rest, the day of rest. It was a time devoted to Yahweh where we would rest from work and worship him. It gets its origin from the creation week where God created the world in six days and on the seventh day rested. So each Sabbath day would be a reminder to his people that, oh yeah, God created everything and then he rested. So there's a worship and a reflection on the whole of creation on the Sabbath by virtue of keeping it as a day of rest. Moses even ties the Sabbath to the Exodus in Deuteronomy. He says, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to keep the Sabbath. It's an act of obedience and honour. Uh, next command, verse 12. Honour your father and your mother so that you may have a long life in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. We parents love this one. This is definitely my favourite. Until I consider my parents. The key to social stability is reverence and respect for parents and authority. Why do you think there's such an attack on the family unit and an interference with a parent's mandate to bring their children up? The promise about life here is obviously to do with the promised land, Canaan, but God's plan is revealed through that promise. His heart is revealed. He's going to set his people up in the borders of this land that he's going to give them, and he, do, he expects them not to tolerate juvenile delinquents. The consequences were fatal. Later on in Israel's history, we read in Ezekiel that one of the reasons for their exile to Babylon was a failure to honour parents. Exodus Verse 13 now, 20, uh, next command. Do not murder. Damn. All right, looks like my next weekend's freed up. There was an irreversible, divinely imposed death sentence on anyone who killed someone else intentionally. This was without rival in the ancient Near East. This was revolutionary a death sentence. For the accidental killing of someone, there was plenty of, um, th there was a, a place where they could go called a city of refuge. They would be banished. It was an accidental killing, but a killing all the same. And so by this command, do not murder, the people were reminded to uh, be careful in the affairs of life so that they don't have anyone die by their hand. We should not have anyone's blood on our hands. The taking of life, the giving of life is God's. Exodus uh, verse 14. Do not commit adultery. Applicable to both men and women. This command protected the sacredness of the marriage relationship that God had instituted when he created man and woman. It was the relationship that would be his plan for filling the earth. And also it would be a reflection of the coming relationship between his son and the church. This is sacred. You don't mess with this. 
the penalty for infidelity in the marriage relationship was death. There might be blood in the streets if that were the case today. Verse 15, do not steal. Any dishonest acquiring of another's goods or assets uh, greatly disturbs the right to ownership of private property. That's important for social stability. Exodus 20, verse 16. Do not give false testimony against your neighbour. Justice is not served by false testimony. Practically all societies around the world have recognised this principle and they all urge people before bearing witness to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Exodus verse 17. Do not covet your neighbour's house. Do not covet your neighbour's wife, his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbour. The thoughts and desires of the heart do not escape attention in God's law. It's a whole law. A strong longing to have what someone else owns is wrong. The tenth command here suggests that none of the previous nine commands are uh, only external acts. Up until now, we might think they're all external acts. And then we get to coveting and it's a matter of the heart. What God's saying is, no, that last one is the doorway into every other one. When you start to have a heart condition go wrong, your actions will follow. A yearning to possess what someone else has leads to sin. So they're the basic house rules of our Father. You can tell a bit about those, uh, about him and his character when you study those rules. You can sense his heart for fairness, can't you? You can sense his heart for justice, protection, freedom, righteousness. They're good rules, amazing rules. As I close, I'd just like us to consider how we're doing with those. So I want to ask you some questions and then we'll answer them together and hopefully we'll be encouraged by how well we're doing. Firstly, the first question I have for you today is, have you ever stolen anything? Have you ripped a song or a, a movie off the internet that you didn't purchase or you've taken something even as a young person? I have. Answer that honestly in your heart. What do you tell someone, what do you call someone who steals something? A thief. Okay, doing well. Have you ever told a lie? Even a white lie, it's all a lie, it's an untruth. Have you ever told a lie? I have, thank you. There's a couple of, what are they? What, what do you call someone who tells a lie? What are you guys? Liars. No, you're not. You're thieving liars. <laughs> Have you ever used the Lord's name in vain? OMG. That's using the Lord's name in vain too. Well, that's blasphemy. And that is punishable by death. Have you ever looked at another person with lust? Because Jesus said, actually... If you even look at that person, have that desire, that, that act is adultery. Me too. Have you ever had a moment where you've hated someone, even just for a good reason, but you've hated them? And Jesus said, if you've ever done that, well then, that condition of your heart, that's murder. So I think if we were doing hands by our own admission, you would have told me, you're all a bunch of murderous, adultering, lying, blaspheming thieves. Where's my wallet? That's not a good scorecard. And we're only halfway through the 10. 
Now with a record like this, all of us, when we stand before God, come on, righteous, we can't get through half the commands. So when we do stand before that righteous God, what are we? Innocent or guilty? Guilty. Heaven or hell? Hell. Every one of us. We deserve that. We've established it. I want to now read you some verses I've got highlighted. They're in my Bible. Very powerful. They're, oh man, sorry. They're very powerful. They'll change eternities. I will um, share these with you if you want them. I highlight one and then I write the reference to the next one. And then I'll highlight that, write the reference to the next one. These are the verses. Romans 3.23 All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We need help. We've all sinned. The next one, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not from works. In accordance with that law, not from works. So no one can boast. There's no religious elite. Or they're worse than anyone. Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death. We've all established we've got it. Here's what's coming. Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Our Lord. It's a gift. You don't earn a gift. You can't earn this one. You just receive it. Hebrews. 927. And just as it is appointed for people to die once and after this, judgment. That's what's going to happen. Not coming back as a butterfly or going into the ground or coming back as a star or, or any other thing. Not another lap. Die. Live once, die, judged. Revelation 21.8. But the cowards faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Die, live once, die, judgment. Any of that, second death. Fire. Now we've all established that we're all those people. So I'm not singling anyone out. I'm saying here we are. Romans 5, 6 to 8. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, we weren't good people, Christ died for us. John 14.6 Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4 For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, He was raised on the third day 
according to the scriptures. He's alive. That's how we know. It's true. We're justified. He's alive. We're not listening to some ancient dead religious dude try to tell us how to live. We've got a living king carrying us when he needs to and walking with us, ensuring that we can live in accordance with him. 1 Peter 2.24 He himself bore our sins on, in his body on the tree so that, having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Amazing. And 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. That's why he did it, that he might bring us to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. John 5.24 Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who, is, who has sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. If you believe this, if you trust Jesus and order your life by his grace, around following and obeying him, you've already received eternal life. You've already crossed from death to life. And you will escape judgment. Or well, judgment will be a, probably a pleasant experience, I would think. Some of us have come here this morning, possibly thinking we're pretty well, uh, pretty well off, spiritually speaking. Like, we're not bad people. We watch the news, we're not on it, and we could stand before a righteous God and give a decent account of our life that might even please Him. I hope you'll think again. Some of us know all too well what we've done with our lives and, and we hate to even think about it. It's a mess. Much less do we want anyone else to know. There's no way we could stand before a righteous God and he would never accept us anyway. Well, I hope that you would think again too. I think maybe the last verse is my favourite. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 13. Let's pray.